Hey everybody, welcome back to Real Birding. Uh, today we have some news. This is uh, big news for North American birders, especially those of us who live in the North. Um, there has been a recent uh, discovery, uh, if you will, of a new species. So without further ado, let's get into it. So, Will, are you telling me that there's a species that we're getting for free here as, as listers in the U.S.? Yeah, so this is going to have a much uh, greater implication for those of us who count the birds that we see, right? We have a life list, um, and especially if we've been traveling and we're uh, doing a, a list on North America and in Europe and multiple continents, our whole world life list, um, if you've birded in Europe and North America, has just uh, gone up by one species most likely. And um, we didn't even uh, have to go discover a species new to science. We just get it for free, huh? It's like an armchair tick. Well, in a way, we did discover a, not we, but in a way, a new species has been discovered, um, but not in the way most people think. I, I think when most people think about discovering a new species, you think about setting up a blind in the middle of the Amazon rainforest or in Papua New Guinea and talking with um, native people using their knowledge to uncover species that have been previously um, not described to science. Uh, but that's not how this happened. This happened um, with some modern techniques um, that's becoming more and more popular. And this has been going on for a long time, but this is what we call a species split. Let's get into it. So first of all, what is a northern goshawk? And is I have a feeling this is a bird that not a lot of birders know or have a lot of experience with. Yeah, so let's pull up this picture here. Yeah, so the northern goshawk is an excipiter. So it's the same genus as sharp hawk and cooper's hawk. So if you're a birder in Michigan, uh, I think a lot of our uh, viewers are going to be Michigan birders. You've seen Cooper's hawks uh, flying around your backyard, picking off warring doves from your bird feeders. You might think of them a bit as the antagonist. But this is like the big, mean, older brother of the Cooper's hawk. It is like the size of a red-tailed hawk. It is totally striking in its plumage, both for the juveniles and the adults, but especially the adults. Um, you got this barred underside, you've got a red eye and a really dark line going straight through the eye going back to the nape. And I feel like, you know, I've been burning for such a long time and I hardly ever see these guys. Like they, they seem like they're really uncommon and they're really hard to find. What's up with that? Well, I'll tell you what, I actually did surveys for this species when I worked for the Michigan Nat Natural Features Inventory. Um, this is a, I think listed as a threatened species in Michigan. Uh, because they are lovers of old growth pine uh, and boreal habitat. Um, and what we did in Michigan about 100 years ago is we logged the vast majority of our pine habitat. So there's only a few places really where this species can thrive in the state of Michigan. So I went into, excuse me, <laughs> the Camp Grayling, which is a, a military training facility in northern Michigan, which is absolutely huge. Uh, with a, a, a vast expanse of habitat that is suitable for the northern goshawk. And for, I want to say, six weeks, I did surveys for this species, and I did not find one. This is where we would actually go out into the field. Yeah, we would go to a point, and we would play a uh, playback of the species calling. They have this really harsh grating um, call that they make. And I did not get one to respond the entire time. The only ones that I saw was where we knew a previous nest was. So we went and we made sure that they were using that previous nest the following spring. Now, as soon as I this project wrapped up and I moved into my golden wing warbler surveys, all of a sudden I'm at this golden wing warbler point and I'm listening for golden wings. And I see this giant exhibitor fly out of the forest, uh, land in a tree and start making this call. So I got some decent pictures of it and reported it to my bosses. But that, that's how kind of secretive and hard to find these species are. It's almost like they, they tend to find you rather than you finding them, you know, unless you're standing on like a Great Lakes shore where migrating hawks are, are kind of around. But, you know, my experience with these guys, it, you know, whereas Cooper's hawk and Sharpshin, are, they're, they're common and they're, they're in more urban and suburban environments in addition to the wild habitats. This, this goshawk is like this, this ghost almost of the northern forests. They're always... They always seem to be like in the forest interior. They're very thin, large territories. So you hardly like, you just don't really bump into them. Like you said, even when you're searching for them, they're, they're just, they're just always this enigmatic thing that it's, it's out there, but you just don't see it very often. So it's always such a treat when you finally do connect. I mean, they're stunning. Well, 
th these pictures or this map is a great example because it shows how habitat obligate they are. Uh, you look at where there's, um, you know, vast stands of pines, it skips completely over the Great Plains here and continues again in the Rockies where you get these pines again. Uh, so it's pretty <laughs> In, in the mountains in each case, right? It's always up in the, in the forested mountaintops in the west. And then, and then backing out generally, and we'll get to the, what's, what, what's happened here that's, that's, that's new, um, is that as you cross the ocean, you suddenly discover that they're in Spain and places like even in the Mediterranean here, which is, which is considerably you know, further south, at least in the east, than, than where we would see them in North America. And then there's not many birding uh, contributors in Russia, so it looks blank, but I know that the purple extends all, all the way over here to, to Siberia even. Yeah, um, it's interesting seeing those few points in Northern Africa, kind of south of the Iberian Peninsula there. Can you yeah. imagine birding in Northern Africa and having a Northern goshawk fly over? No doubt in my mind, you've got wintering, a few wintering birds that just went a little bit further south, and you have that same phenomenon over here. Um, you know, even, like we're, we're in Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo area, you know, the goshawk really only breeds south to about that line. And how many times have you seen them down here? Once? Zero? Like they hardly I, ever come down here. They do, but it's just, it's real rare. I had one time birding near Holland uh, in late fall and I had what I thought was a northern goshawk. And, you know, it's not unheard of. It's a wintering bird that comes a little bit further than they usually do. Um, but you were the eBird reviewer and you didn't accept that record. And I think probably rightfully so because it's rare and without a really good um, confirmation or really good uh, view of the bird, it's hard to say Cooper's Hawk or Northern Goshawk, you know. I, I actually, as you're saying this, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, I had totally forgotten about that. You know, and I'll fully admit, you know, the other problem with these rare goshawks when they come down here is that you often just don't get good looks at them and you need a good look to be able to tell it from a coop, especially if you're, if you're dealing with um, one of these young individuals, I'll switch over to the tab here. So this plumage, which is the juvenile bird, same here. It actually looks way more similar to a juvenile Cooper's hawk than the adult goshawk looks to an adult Cooper's hawk. So, and, and, and also this is the age class that tends to va the vagrate or come, come south more often. So the, it, it really compounds the ability to, to even identify it when it's a south of range. You, you rarely can get photos of them because they're trying to hide and, and they're, they have a huge home range, like they're moving all over the place. So anyhow, that's sort of the backstory. And uh, why don't you catch us up to speed on what the new development is with gas hawks or as you're occasionally you'll occasionally hear gosh hawk yes exactly so when we're talking about new species being discovered via a split in species so it means we have one parent species that usually has a pretty big range um, that spans different habitat types that maybe they have different plumages or different behavioral characteristics when that gets called into question sometimes people do genetic tests on these birds and figure out that the two populations that we thought were subspecies are actually uh, should be considered separate species. So yeah, let's let's open up. Um, do you have one of those papers pulled up? Actually, who's the body that controls the checklist of North American birds uh, and who assesses the current science to make sure that we've got the the current species correct? Who who is that? It would be the uh, the AOS, the American Ornitho Ornithological Society, right? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And I think it's their their uh, NACC, the North American Checklist Committee, who is a, it's a committee of scientists who really know uh, species concepts and they, they are, they're experts in things like genetics and, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, morphometric analysis, um, all, all the types of things that you would look at in order to determine wh what things are species and which things are, are not, or there may be just a subspecies, for example. Yeah, so let me read this little um, statement made by the AOS. Um, as soon as they made this decision. Um, so it says, the Northern goshawk, Exhibitor gentilis, is being split into two species. A proposal from NACC member Sean M. Billerman of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology highlights key vocal and genetic differences between what had been treated as two subspecies groups within Northern goshawk, the Pale Arctic gentilis, and the Near Arctic atricapillus. Atricapillus. At atricapillus, I would say. At atricapillus, fine. Yep. Um, because the newly recognized Eurasian goshawk, Agentilis, 
has occasionally been recorded from North America, a few lucky bird enthusiasts might be able to include both Eurasian goshawk and American goshawk on their North American lists. This is an interesting split, not only because both species are known from North America, one as a resident and the other as an accidental, but because two different subspecies of the Eurasian goshawk are known from North America, Chester says. So actually, I, I piggybacking on that, I'll, when you're an eBird here, you can type in goshawk, northern goshawk, and then you can see the two offerings for here for Eurasian and American. So we already recognize these as subspecies, but as you switch to the Eurasian one, um, there's one of them right there. It was looks like it was seen on the on one of the outer uh, Shemaya Island. Wow. Actually, an old buddy of mine used to be the one who worked out there, Mike Schwitters from Montana. Um, and I know they have other employees now. And then there, there is a specimen from somewhere in Newfoundland or, or, or the Maritimes. I forget exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but just a few of them. And, you know, with, you know, raptors generally don't cross the ocean very well. So it makes total sense that, you know, the population over here is going to be genetically separated from the ones here because over time, they just go in their in their different directions. It's just like the normal evolutionary process. So, I'm I actually wanted to open up the uh, the photos of the Eurasian ones. Let's talk about how they look. Okay, so here's a Quebec uh, a American northern goshawk, and then I can switch over to the uh, Eurasian one from Spain here. Wow. And so, what do you see when you see the different? I mean, to me, the the streaking on the underparts really jumps out as very strong and bold on the old world one and much less so uh there's actual video of the eurasian one there wow um, the head is is not blackish colored the the markings are kind of the same slate gray color as the back but then when we switch over to the us one you get this much darker capped look and then the fine streak the the underneath streaking is more like powder or something it's not the streaks aren't as well defined I mean, it's pretty different looking don't you agree yeah, it's something I wasn't really aware of before this split happened. I knew that they, I knew that they were, what are they, how would you say, it? whole Arctic. I knew that they sort yeah. of were throughout the north, um, um, in both the old world and the new world. Uh, but I did not know that they looked so different. Um, that that alone is should raise some some eyebrows for consideration for species. Absolutely. I mean, I think people were already onto the fact that they might be different species back then, and and. Yeah, I mean, speaking more broadly about that, you know, I have heard estimates that instead, like we, there's about 10,000 or 11,000 bird species recognized right now. Everybody that knows the genetics that I've talked to says it's going to be the actual number will be closer to 20,000. So like double what it is now. But pe you just people have to go do the work in order for these splits to take place because they, they're not going to split them until you have the data. Yeah. So so actually to speak to that on the goshawks, um, I sort of skimmed through the paper, see, see what they did. And what they did is they went through a, a, a variety of these specimens of, of all of these goshawk forms throughout the world. And there are other species that are closely related um, in Africa, the black goshawk, there's the Chilean goshawk in South America, and then there's like one in Madagascar, and there's also one in New Guinea. And they took mm -hmm. foot pads um, from each of the, there's three subspecies in, the U in North America, and then two subspecies in Eurasia. They took foot pads and got DNA, and then they used PCR like we do in most of the studies and amplified it, and then ran a variety of analytics to see which of the groups were similar and different. And what was very interesting is that they found out, uh, and here are the different groups that I was referring to, or some of them, maybe anyway, different, different subspecies. Mm -hmm. um, what they found was that the Eurasian goshawk is actually less I get the terminology wrong, but it's less closely related to the American one than it is to some of the other groups in, you know, like the Africa, whatever the African and Madagascar, you know, Madagascar uh, and Papua New Guinean uh, forms were, which was a very interesting result. Yeah, it's so interesting how before all this genetic testing, we were really to, 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 to think about which species are the same species and which species are different species. We were using criteria that is not necessarily the most useful criteria to use. Um, like you said, when we're using this genetic testing, we find out that this northern goshawk, this goshawk of the north in Europe, is more closely related to these tropical goshawks uh, than it is to the other northern goshawk in North America. Um, it, it's amazing what, what science has been able to produce in terms of um, taxonomy in the last uh, 50 years or so. 
Oh, it's, I mean, I think it's cutting edge. And I think that we're really at the precipice of just an onslaught of future splits. I mean, there, there, there's always going to be a lumping and splitting dynamic where things come back together, like the, like the Western flycatcher, the Pacific Slope and Cordilleran flycatchers um, just got lumped back together. Good move, by the way. That's a whole other video. Um, yeah. And But for the most part, I think you're going to see advances resulting in a lot more splitting and a lot more addition of species over time. Um, I have something for you, Will. Sure. This topic of bird naming has been such a hot topic, hot button lately. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that always gets me is when we add a new species like uh, what's now called thick-billed longspur instead of McCown's longspur. Um, I felt that when you choose a, a name like thick build is just kind of dull and boring. Like I, I, I'd much rather have something that has some, uh, some pizzazz or some color or spice to it. Like bay winged long spur. That thing has like this nice orange patch in the wing. Yeah. Um, so for no, for our Northern goshawk, like, yeah, American goshawk, it's a nice name, but it's just kind of dull. Like I, how, how about this? How about we call it the American grouse terminator? What do you think? Oh my gosh, that's perfect. Yeah, or um, it's not exactly a peregrine falcon, but there's those awesome pictures of the the goshawk taking out the the ring-billed gull. In the yes, the, I know peregrine falcons are more um, infamous for taking out uh, gulls that people are looking at. That's happened with a few uh, really rare Ross's gulls that show up. They get immediately taken out by peregrine falcons. Here's the photo you're referring to. Check this out. This this actually just came from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, by Kathy Koenig. And what a monster bird to be grabbing gulls and just manhandling them like this. I mean, just incredible. Yeah, so to be clear about scale here, that gull is, that's your typical beach gull that you see. There's ring-billed gulls and herring gulls, and ring-billed gulls are the smaller of the two that you see on the beach. This goshawk is as big, if not bigger, than these ring-billed gulls, which is... Um, not the same case for the Cooper's hawk that you might see in your backyard. Uh, th these birds are like total beasts. Oh, I, in terms of like pound for pound brute, I don't think anybody can, can match the Northern goshawk. It is, it is yep. just such a beefy powerhouse of a bird. Sure. You, you got me thinking as you were talking here. All right, watch this. So uh, an old friend of mine, Sam Gaelic from, from uh, Cape May, New Jersey area, was birding Cape May Point, 25th November, 2012. This is the checklist. And hawks were actively migrating south, as they always do at the point. And he witnessed this happen. Check this out. So this is a Northern Goshawk juvenile, and this is a Cooper's Hawk juvenile. And he wow. they're, they're coming in side by side, and watch what takes place. And again, these are migrating birds. It's not, it's not like they're settled into a winter territory or settled into a breeding territory or something. They're literally working their way down the Atlantic coast and look what happens. Whoa. Oh <laughs> my God. So the goshawk just grabs the Cooper's hawk. The co I mean, the Cooper's hawk is like in, a beast in its own might. I mean, it's smaller. It catches like smaller birds, but it's just goofing its way down the coast and all of a sudden, boom, and the big gray ghost of the north comes in and nails you. So... so so that Cooper's hawk is, is done, though? It's over? Oh, right? it's over. That thing got eaten on the spot. So maybe a better, maybe a better name is like Assassin Goshawk. <laughs> I like it. I never know whether to be excited about these splits or to be upset about them. But in this case, I think it does make a lot of sense. I think the, the populations are not reproducing. They're not crossing paths very often. And it just comes down to a matter of time before they just differentiate themselves sufficiently to become a species and i yeah i mean it makes sense to me they got the genetic data look pretty pretty clear that they're really different already so yeah. way to go aos and acc as always thanks for watching be sure to like subscribe share do whatever you want to engage with us um and go birding get out there and find your own american goshawk or grouse terminator whatever you prefer until next time peace